Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the latest European Parliamentary Research Service book talk. As you know, we hold these book talks regularly on major books that have come out in recent years about the history of the European Union, about the process of European integration, and much more widely than that in the whole range of politics and economics. I'm Anthony Teasdale from the European Parliamentary Research Service, and we're delighted to be discussing today this book, Robert Triffin, A Life. It's been published by Oxford University Press earlier this year, and it's by Ivo Maas and Ilaria Passotti. And they're going to talk a little bit about the book itself, why they wrote it, what the principal themes are, and the messages that are relevant today. For those who aren't familiar with uh, Robert Triffin, he was a Belgian-American economist who played a central role in the debates about European and international monetary policy from the Second World War right the way through to his death in 1993. Uh, Triffin worked at the US Federal Reserve, at the International Monetary Fund, and at the OEC, the OEEC, which is now, of course, the OECD in Paris. He taught at Yale University. He helped uh, in his post-war policymaking role to found the European Payments Union in the, 1940, in, the, in the 40s. He advised Jean Monnet's Action Committee on the United States of Europe in the 1950s. And famously, he predicted the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in the 1960s and eventually, of course, in the 1970s. Because basically, the absence of a supranational authority, at, in effect, at global level, meant that national and international monetary policies were becoming increasingly inconsistent and out of sync, a problem exposed in particular by the uh, impact of the Vietnam War. And the result, of course, was the collapse of the gold standard in the early 1970s, which indeed he foresaw. He was also one of the first serious advocates of European monetary integration. He proposed the, Euro the creation of a European reserve fund to pool national reserves across Europe and a new European Union of account, which he proposed to call the uh, Europa. And of course, a, a, European, uh, union, a, a European unit of account was indeed created. And he wanted to see this develop in the first instance as a parallel currency and potentially it could develop as a single currency in due course. And as such, he is now, in a way, one of the forgotten architects of the euro. Ivo and Ilaria are going to talk now about their book. Uh, Ivo is, of course, uh, no stranger to this particular forum because a previous book which he wrote, uh, co-authored, The Architects of the Euro, was the subject of an EPRS book talk uh, four or five years ago. And so without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Ivo and Ilaria to speak, and then we're going to move to a panel discussion <laughs> with three leading experts, uh, Jacques de la Roisière, the former managing director of the European Monetary Fund, a former president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, former governor of the Banque de France. Susan Housen, who is Emeritus Professor of Economics and Fellow of Trinity College at the University of Toronto. And Bernard Soin, who is the president of Robert Triffin International and a former director both of the EBRD and of the World Bank. So over to Ivo. Hey, thanks. Uh... And first of all, uh, I would like to, to thank uh, very much the European Parliamentary Research Service and especially Anthony Teasdale for this uh, kind uh, invitation. And we, we can go to the slideshow. Yeah, we, we can go to the next slide. Uh, and so Robert Triffin, um, so he's famous for the, the Triffin Dilemma, uh, predicting the end of Bretton Woods, the Cassandra who predicted the end of Bretton Woods. But it was not only an economic analysis. Uh, for Triffin, it, it was also very much a moral problem. Um, and uh, a moral problem that the United States, uh, the richest country in the world, was financing its balance of payments deficit, partly to pay for the Vietnam War. Uh, and this was financed by countries which were much poorer. And, and so in this biography, uh, where the, the title of the introduction uh, is uh, a monk in economist clothing, we, we go also into the, this person of, of Robert Triffin. Now, Triffin, uh, the key point was Bretton Woods is not sustainable, and, and so he was also a policy practitioner. He came with forward with proposals to get to a new and better international monetary system. 
And so his plan A was we should reform the international monetary system very much on the lines of, of John Maynard Keynes, an international currency, an international central bank. But Triffin was very much aware that um, this would not work. And that was, this was very difficult. And so we said we should have a plan B. And his plan B was regional monetary integration, especially in Europe. Uh, next slide. Um, so here you see the, the plan of the book, um, Robert Triffin alive. And uh, it's very much chronological. You first go into uh, his early years. He was a child of the interwar period. Then he was very active in Latin America for the uh, American Federal Reserve Board. He became the architect of the European Payments Union in the late 1940s. And then he moved to Yale University as a professor, still very much involved in analysis of the international monetary system as the Bretton Woods Cassandra, but also very much involved in policy work, especially as the monetary expert on Monet's Action Committee for the United States of, of Europe. And then in 79, he returned to Belgium, where he was uh, very active in the creation of the European monetary system and especially the development of, of a market for the private AQ. Next slide. So, Triffin's early years. He, he was a child of the interwar period. He was born in October 1911 in Flaubec, which is La Wallonie Picard, and, and from a very modest family. Uh, his father was a butcher. And uh, here you see the, a family picture of the Triffin family with the, the young Triffin and his older brother, uh, Armand. And, and so Triffin was the first in his family to, to study at high school and university, uh, as he was discovered by, by the local uh, priest. And so he went to, to study at the University of, of Louvain. And, and there, he, this was a, a real change for Triffin. And he became, um, he was part of the progressive Catholics, uh, uh, and he would stay this very much um, for the whole of his life. And, and so he became a profound pacifist um, under the influence of Einstein, even if he never met Einstein. And, and then he also, he was very active in l'avant-garde. And there was this fascination with Henri de Man's new socialism. Um, the man who was a critic of uh, traditional Marxism and uh, putting emphasis much more on culture, but then also on the plan to get out of the crisis. Then also remarkable, one of Triffin's classmates in Louvain was Léon de Grel. Léon de Grel, who was, uh, who would become the, the leader of the, the fascist Rex movement in Belgium. And so you really see that, that Triffin now is there in this interwar period uh, of uh, the next slide. This interwar period, the Great Depression. And the Great Depression, well, it marked a whole generation of economists. Uh, like also many good friends of Triffin, like Samuelson, Tobin, they became con convinced the market economy is not self-adjusting. And so they, they studied economics, and for them, studying economics, it was a way to, to build a better future. Next slide. And so Triffin, he studied economics. Now, who were the important professors in Louvain? Well, there were two, some of the, two of the most important professors were Janssen Albert Edouard Janssen and Paul van Zeeland. They were both active in politics, the Belgian Central Bank, and they were teaching the courses on money and central banking in Louvain. And the basic approach of uh, Janssen and van Zeeland was that uh, they looked at the dynamics of the monetary system and how the monetary system was uh, evolving away from gold and that uh, fiducia money would become more important and the monetary system would not be based anymore on gold, but on the fiduciary money. 
Now, Treffen would take this, and this would become one of his ideas for the international monetary system, that also the international monetary system should be evolving away from gold. Another important professor was Duprier. And Duprier, he was into business cycle analysis, and he was also at the Belgian Central Bank. Um, and business cycle analysis, it's a very empirical approach, dynamics, emphasis on the transition period. And now the professors of Louvain, Van Zeeland, Duprier, they were very much involved in the preparation of the Belgian devaluation of 1935. And then it was the young Robert Triffin who would make the calculations of this devaluation. Next slide. In 1935, Triffin moved to Harvard University. And this would be a complete change for Triffin. As in Harvard, there was a completely different approach towards economics. It was not this empirical uh, business cycle approach, even Schumpeter was there. And also there, there was business cycle theory. But Schumpeter was also general equilibrium theory. Moreover, there was Vasily Leontiev, there was Edward Chamberlain. And, and so Treffen made a PhD on monopolistic competition and general equilibrium theory. So a very theoretical PhD. And later in his life, he, he would not be involved in, in pure economic theory, but his PhD would be important as it would shape his perception, Triffin, he would always look for where, is, where are power relations. If something happens, where is the counterpart, the, the, the general equilibrium approach. Next slide. Now Triffin, um, he, he quickly, he went back to Belgium after his PhD, went quickly back to the United States. Um, he married an American lady. The Second World War started. He became an American citizen, and like many economists, during the war, he moved to Washington, working for the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, and there he became a specialist of Latin America. Now, what was Triffin's vision on Latin America? Now, in traditional developed economies, it's the dynamics between saving and investment which determines the economic cycle. When Triffin analyzed his Latin American economies, he said, look, what determines the dynamics of the economy, whether the economy, economy is growing or in recession, well, it's how their exports and their imports evolve. And so he was very much on these dependencies theories, and so saying, look, it's export and imports which make for the economic dynamics in these countries, and export and imports, well, it's very much how the world economy, especially developed countries, are doing. And so he would write uh, a first important essay on the, the world economy, the international monetary system, called National Central Banking and the International Economy. And so for Treffen, as the shocks in the system were related to the external system, what countries needed was international liquidity to get through uh, the cycle. Next slide. And... And so we get to Triffin's uh, most famous work, the Gold and the Dollar Crisis in 1960. And there you have this fundamental idea which he had at the end uh, of the 40s. We have to look at international liquidity. There should be an adequate level of international reserves and liquidity in an expanding world economy. And now when Triffin looked at the Bretton Woods system, the gold exchange standard with gold and the dollar as the two key international means of payment and reserve assets, he said, well, this is really a vulnerable system. And he said, it, and he emphasized the vulnerability of a world monetary system whose operation becomes increasingly dependent on one of a few national currencies as major components of international monetary reserves. So Triffin would really emphasize you an international monetary system, you cannot have national currencies as reserve assets. And so you get to, to the famous Triffin dilemma. And next uh, slide. And, and here you see the, the chart in red, the red dotted lines, you see US gold, uh, and you see how US gold 
uh, assets are going down. And the blue line gives the external liabilities of the United States. And you, say, and you see that these are going up. Now, um, Griffin said, look, this is not sustainable. Um, if there are too many international assets, countries like the Gaulle in France would ask to, to that uh, they would that the dollars would be converted in gold, and so the United States would not be able to uh, guarantee the convertibility of the dollar in gold. And so that's the famous Triffin dilemma. Now, what was Triffin's way out of it? Well, an international currency, very much like John Maynard Keynes. And so he, he tried to push this idea. And uh, the most uh, an important moment in this reform of the international monetary system was 1967, the Rio Agreement, where the special drawing rights were created. And, and so this was something with Triffin. On the one hand, he said, this is very good. We have now a, re a truly international reserve asset. But then he said, look, this is not enough. And for two reasons. Firstly, he said the dollar still keeps a function, and so the, the vulnerability of the system remains. And then he was not happy with the allocation of SDRs. He said, look, in the system of the IMF, the countries which have most reserves get most SDRs. And he said, well, this is not really what is needed for uh, the world economy. He said, we should create SDRs and get, put them at the function of development of the, the world. And this is very much the discussion which was still going on at the latest IMF meeting uh, last month. Next slide. And so uh, Triffin, he, he correctly predicted the, the end of the Bretton Woods system, but the end of the Bretton Woods system implied, did not imply the end of dollar supremacy. And, and so Triffin, he admitted then later, uh, I was totally wrong in underestimating the duration and the size of the U.S. deficits that foreign central bankers would be willing to absorb at the cost of an inflationary explosion of world monetary reserves. So the Triffin dilemma, it got solved in uh, a world inflation. And, and so, um, uh, um, next slide. I will leave now the floor to Ilaria, and she will discuss especially Triffin's plan B, regional monetary integration. Thank you, Ivo. Trifin play a key role in the creation of the European Payment Union. The economic historian Baker, Barry Eichengreen described him as the EPU architect, and we found further evidence in the OECD and IMF archives. Trifin was at the IMF Research Department as the head of the Exchange Control Division when Western Europe became a crucial policy issue of the post-World War II period, especially with the Marshall Plan. Already in the autumn 1937, he wrote an internal memorandum where, in line with his pragmatic approach, he focused on the ways to solve the concrete monetary problems of the period that is, the inconvertibility of the European currencies and the restoration of a multilateral trade and payment system. And he made a proposal for a European clearing union. Trifin left the IMF because of his disagreement with the IMF official position toward the European monetary matters. As a special advisor of the American agency that managed the Marshall Plan in Europe, Triffin was actively involved in the final stage of the negotiation of the EPU. He successfully suppressed for two elements that we are important for institution building. Firstly, a board of directors entrusted with the coordination of member countries' adjustment policy and providing liquidity as a temporary relief. Secondly, the adoption of a unit of account as a common denominator for all the accounts. Next slide, please. 
Trifin remained further involved in the process of the European monetary integration and became one of the fathers of the euro. His plans were very much based on his experience with the EPU. The cornerstone of his monetary project were the creation of a European reserve fund and a single currency unit. The ERF would be constituted by pooling part of the international reserves of central banks. The deposit would be expressed in a European unit of account with appropriate exchange guarantees. The fund would provide loans to member countries with balance of payment difficulties and would intervene in international exchange markets, similarly performing open market operation by national central banks in their domestic markets. This would pave the way for the fund to evolve naturally into a European monetary authority. With the EPU, Trifin introduced a new geographical entity into his analysis, the region. In his view, the regional and worldwide approach towards monetary integration were complementary, aiming at a new multipolar international monetary system with the European community as an essential pillar, still an important point agenda for the European Union. He was convinced that the regional monetary integration would contribute to a more stable international monetary system. Next slide. The idea for an IRF figured prominently in the debates about a European monetary integration. It was, was, it was strongly supported by Jean Monnet, who turned to Trifin as the monetary expert of his Action Committee for the United States for Europe for preparing a memorandum in 1958, when the French financial crisis threatened the country's participation in the common market project. At this time, it was also discussed at the European Commission, as Trifin was an official advisor of Robert Marjolaine. The Commission was reflecting on how it could fulfill its own role in the macroeconomic and monetary sphere. Then the ERF came on the agenda of the December 1969 OGCOMI summit via Willy Brandt, who, as a member of the Monet Action Committee, consulted it. The Monet Triffin Network was also important in the work of the Werner Committee that was set up in 1970 to map out a plan for the EMU. Even if the concept of an ERF was watered down in the committee by opting for a European Fund for Monetary Cooperation with more limited function, Trifin, who was still at the commission, was active in drawing up proposal for this fund. Finally, the 1979 agreement for the European monetary system provided for the creation of a European monetary fund that had a strong resemblance with Trifin project. There is also a similarity with the European stability mechanism established in 2012. The underlying principle is very much the same. By demonstrating a collective stance, such mechanisms are a more efficient way to avert speculation than isolated national measures. Next slide. Trifin was a strong advocate of the introduction of a European currency. It was a constant element in his thinking and policy proposal from the EPU unit of account to the ECO in the European monetary system. He promoted it both in the official monetary circuits and in commercial one. In particular, Trifin played an active role in the development of the private use of European currency unit. Already at the beginning of the 1960s, he worked in tandem with Ferdinand Colling, the chief executive officer of the Credit Bank, 
one of the Belgium's largest commercial banks, that in 1961 issued the first bond in European unit of accounts. In the 1980s, Triffin promoted various initiatives for creating a private eco market. In 1981, the Credit Bank, the Instituto Bancario San Paolo, and Credit Lyonnais led a banking consortium that issued an international loan denominated and payable in ECO. Then, in 1982, a working party was set up with a view to establishing a multilateral clearing system for operation in private ECO. It was composed of a group of commercial banks the European Investment Bank, under the aegis of the European Commission. For Triffin, the development of the eco market was important to build a critical mass for monetary union. Next slide. In conclusion, Robert Triffin became famous with the, the Triffin Dilemma, and as the Cassandra who predicted the end of the Bretton Woods system, the Triffin Dilemma still offers a framework to analyze the international monetary system and is still very much present in the current policy debates. Moreover, for Triffin, the USA balance of payment deficit was not only an economic issue, but also a moral one. He was disgusted and outraged that the richest countries in the world was financed by the poor countries. Very much like Keynes, he was in favor of a true international reserve currency. For Triffin, the so-called housing order approach that every country would push domestic stability was not sufficient for a sustainable and stable international monetary system. He rather took a systematic view, always lo looking for the counterpart in the international adjustment process. He was an architect of the EPU, and this experience shaped his later proposal for the regional monetary integration. In Triffin eyes, the regional and worldwide approaches to monetary integration we are not contradictory, but complementary. He aimed at the creation of a new multipolar international monetary system, still an important issue today. And finally, Triffin was a very policy-oriented economist. He became influential in policy-making circles and was a dominant voice in international and European monetary debates for years. Throughout his life, he remained faithful to the idols of his youth. The young Triffin was critical about the Versailles Treaty, while the old Triffin was against the Vietnam War. For him, economics was a way to contribute to a better, more just, and more peaceful world. He was indeed a true monk in economist clothing. Thank you very much indeed, Ilaria. Thank you very much indeed, Evo, for setting the scene so beautifully as to the role of the intellectual uh, contribution and the importance of somebody who was both an intellectual and a policymaker in the development of closer integration globally and within the European continent and one of those figures whose lasting legacy is indeed uh, Europe's single currency. For those of you who have just tuned in, we are talking about this book, Robert Triffin, A Life, which Ivo Mace and um, Ilaria Pasotti have written together, published earlier this year. And it builds on a previous book, which we also discussed in the EPRS book talk, which is called Architects of the Euro, Intellectuals in the Making of European Monetary Union, which Kenneth Dyson and Ivor Mace uh, put together five years ago. And that book provides very interesting uh, chapters about the roles of not only Triffin, but also Marjolaine, Raymond Barr, Pierre Werner, Roy Jenkins, Hans Tietmeyer, Colotto Pearl, Thomas Padua Schopper, and uh, last but not least, Jacques Delors in the process which led to the creation of the single currency. And to discuss not only the book, but the life and times of, um, of Robert Triffin and the life and times of monetary uh, policy and monetary integration, we're joined by a, a panel with a very distinguished first speaker and two 
extremely important figures intellectually and policy-wise uh, flanking them. First of all, Jacques Deloisière, who, as I mentioned previously, is the former governor of the Banque de France, former managing director of the International Monetary Fund and former president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, and like uh, Bernard Swan, you, Robert Triffin, personally, over to Jacques Deloisière. It's a great privilege to have you here with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, it's with great pleasure that uh, I participate in the presentation of uh, my friend Ivo Bass's remarkable book on Robert Griffin. It is uh, an important book, and I will try to highlight its um, topicality. Uh, this book should uh, inspire us all. Firstly, what are the anomalies, quote unquote, of our international system, such as Robert Griffin denounced them some 60 years ago? I would cite four elements. The first is that, as uh, Ivo said, the richest country in the world, the United States of America, lives on credit and thrives on being financed by other countries, even the poorest. The second element is that the actors in the system are free to choose their exchange rate policy. Sometimes they decide to let it float, or they prefer to manage it, quote unquote, uh, avoiding thus appreciation of their currency in order to maintain their desired competitiveness. Thirdly, the effort to adjust balance of payments imbalances deficits falls exclusively on deficit countries, with the exception of the United States, and not on countries with structural surpluses. It is a major defect in the system. And lastly, supplying the world with liquidity is now mainly due to the external deficit of one country, the United States of America, creditors by dollars. Now, one of the problems with these so-called anomalies is that you get used to them and you don't try to make things better anymore. My second point is to explain the dilemma. Uh, it has been done by the two previous speakers, so I shall be short on this one. Triffin has done a great deal to analyze the deficiencies of the Bretton Woods system and try to remedy them. He was one of the first to understand the contradiction which is inherent in the Bretton Woods system, which had been designed at the end of the war in 1944 to restore a world economic and monetary order. For about 15 years, the system set up around the International Monetary Fund in 1944 worked fairly well. The United States combined a balanced current account and capital outflows that irrigated the world in search of dollars. And the deficit countries, which had been impoverished or even destroyed by war, benefited from capital inflows coming from the United States and also from a relative macroeconomic discipline. But 
the system got out of her hands at the end of 1960s. And it was to Robert Triffin's credit that he was one of the first to understand it and to demonstrate it with a remarkable independence of mind, lucidity, and foresight. The rise in public expenditure in the United States was the cause of this international disruption. Indeed, it was necessary to finance the welfare state that had developed in the United States after the war, and then to finance the Vietnam War, which was a real abyss in terms of public spending. Rather than finance these waves of spending through taxes or savings, the United States resorted to borrowing. The world, still looking for dollars for ensuring its growth, thus financed the growing deficit of the United States by buying with its savings the debt issued in dollars by the Americans. But in doing so, as Ivo explained in his chart, the ratio of U.S. dollar debt to the U.S. gold stock deteriorated. But the world system was based on the gold convertibility of dollars held by foreign banks. Triffin was the one who formulated the famous dilemma, which I will cite in the following way. Or the United States controlled their budget and current account balances by restricting domestic consumption, but then the world runs the risk of a recession. Or they finance on credit their development as well as their wars, and the abundance of dollars thus created will one day show the impossibility to ensure the convertibility of the dollar into gold. It was, of course, the second branch of this dilemma, of this alternative that came about. And on the 15th of August, 1971, the United States put an end to the gold convertibility of the dollar and therefore to the Baton Rouge system. The international monetary system gave up 30 years after its institution the system of fixed exchange rates. I come now to what happened afterwards. The end of Bretton Woods was not going to solve the problems. For a time, it was thought that abandoning fixed exchange rates would solve everything. With flexible exchange rates, it was thought that the states, and first and foremost, foremost the United States, were going to recoup freedom to choose their policy mix. Imbalances would naturally be resolved by exchange rate fluctuations on the markets and by capital movements, now free from controls. At last, the world was free. But in fact, the world was not free. The world was not liberated. It had become increasingly dependent on financial markets, which have, with many accompanying innovations, taken the predominant place in the functioning of the international monetary system. This non-system, the one we live in, is characterized by massive global indebtedness, and global indebtedness always generates financial crisis, one day or another, bubbles and defaults. 
It's characterized also by a preference for holding liquid assets rather than long-term investments, which are so badly needed. The maintenance of what Giscard d'Estaing had called the exorbitant privilege of the dollar, U.S. deficits remain the central element of the supplying the world with reserves, and the U.S. continues to live on credit and to issue the international currency. And this is accompanied by the extreme modesty of the attempt to create an international currency advocated by Keynes and Triffin in the form of special drawing heights. Now, if you look at these imperfections, which were denounced by Triffin, you arrive at a very simple conclusion. They can only be resolved by moving towards greater international cooperation. One of the lessons of Robert Triffin's work is important to meditate on. It is the author's interest in international institutions. You heard it a minute ago. He always believed that the IMF and later on the European institutions should play a key role in the organization of our system. In this regard, I would like to recall the following episode. When, in 1949, an ordinary order devaluation of the exchange rates of a large number of countries had to take place because many slippages and deviations had occurred in the years before 1949. Britain, whose other countries had been waiting for the decision, their decision before taking a position, Britain did not want the international monetary system fund to intervene. The U.S. director at the IMF was called Mr. Southern, and he therefore organized informal, quote, unquote, discussions at the IMF to assess reasonable amounts of future devaluations. But the British insisted that the managing director of the IMF, who was Mr. Good, a Belgian at that time, should not participate in these discussions. Triffin, he was a young man less than 40 years old, vigorously denounced this attitude, which he thought, with reason, was contrary to the IMF's article of agreement. In short, and I will finish my little presentation this way, the following points remain topical, critical, and call for action. I will cite four. Firstly, any orderly, quote unquote, international system cannot ex ignore exchange rate relations and their stability between large countries. Secondly, it is necessary, therefore, to entrust an independent and competent monetary organization with the task of supervising exchange rate relations. This does not mean, in my mind, a return to absolute fixed parities between major currencies, as it was the case in the Bretton Woods system. But this implies agreement on the idea of seeking a rational and desirable operational relationship between exchange rates and economic policy. 
Thirdly, and this is important, especially in a context of uh, excessive leverage like the one we know, the triggering of the economic cycle is now a matter of finance, much more than economics and demand. It is the monetary policy of the United States that rules the world. Its changes make their mark on the financial cycle. It would therefore be logical to pay a little more attention to the international implications of monetary policies of large states from the point of view of financial stability. The system is much more financialized and monetized than it was in the earlier days. And lastly, economic adjustment should not be forgotten. A stable monetary policy should always be based on a sufficient element of international economic cooperation. You can't make the system work in a stable way if the individual countries pursue a totally individual monetary and economic policy. You need an element of, uh, of discipline. And perhaps this is the weak point of Triffin's work. As you have heard, Triffin paid a lot of attention and spent a lot of his energy on organizing the financing of the European Union eventually. But I feel, this is my own opinion, which I do not uh, claim to be the, the right one, but in my view, it seems that Triffin has not sufficiently insisted on the fact that if you don't have a modicum of discipline in the way each country organizes its policy mix, it's going to be very difficult to have this cooperation on the exchange rates. Of course, financing, international financing can help and can to some degree be an element of this cementing the system. But it can't do all the job. The main part of the job has to be done by economic adjustment. And um, even if that is not uh, the highlight of Triffin's work, I think it is, it is good to remember that. Now, if we don't mend these four elements which I have just cited, what is the risk? The risk is a proliferation of exchange rate wars by means of competing monetary policies, protectionism, which is always a ominous threat. And therefore, I think the actuality, the topical nature of the proposals of Robert Triffitt is as uh, true and as important as ever. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we really appreciate those um, remarks. A very a clear and penetrating analysis, not only of Triffin's thinking and contribution, but the operation and evolution of the international monetary system from the 1960s through to today. And it comes from one of the most influential and important uh, international economic policy makers of the 1970s, 80s, and 1990s. Thank you very much uh, indeed. We now go over to um, Toronto in Canada, where we are joined by Professor Susan Halson, uh, Emeritus Professor of Economics at the University there in Toronto, uh, a noted expert and writer about the history of monetary policy, 
author of um, a biography already of Lionel Robbins, writing, I believe, at the moment a, a biography of James Mead, so two of the most important mid-century Anglo-Saxon economists. And she's going to give her perspective on what she's heard so far and the relationship with the thinking of those whom she studied so closely. So uh, over to you in Toronto, to Susan. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I must first thank Evo for asking me to um, join this discussion. Um, I think it's because I did uh, comment on drafts of um, some of the chapters of the book. And Evo thought that I might like to say something about the perspectives of Robbins and Mead on Triffin's work. Um, but I'm not actually going to say much about Robbins. Um, because when I read the biography as a whole, um, I was struck by the parallels between Triffin's and Mead's lives and careers, uh, which I think makes their differing views on international monetary reform all the more interesting. Uh, Mead was slightly older than Triffin, uh, but only by four years. He was an undergraduate at Oxford and in the late 20s, and then became, in 1930, a fellow of one of the smaller colleges. Uh, meanwhile, Triffin was at Louvain and then at Harvard. Mead was, like Triffin, a child of the interwar period. He chose to switch to economics because of concern about the state of the world, about widespread unemployment, and also about especially about international monetary relations. Um, I might comment that just mention that James did not become a pacifist, but he did marry a Quaker, um, and indeed married into a prominent Quaker family. He and um, Triffin were both convinced internationalists, seeing international cooperation and um, integration, indeed, um, as the only way to avoid war. Uh, he worked in, very actively for the League of Nations Union while he was in Oxford, and that's how he got to know his wife. And then he took leave from his Oxford College in 1938 to go and work for the League of Nations in Geneva. And the two men agreed always also on the need to reconcile international monetary and financial policies with the requirements of external balance in a post-gold standard world, um, which I suppose will be the theme of what I have to say about Mead. Um, Evo has emphasized, uh, Evo and Lillard have emphasized that um, many of Triffin's ideas were similar to those of Keynes. And there is no doubt about Keynes's influence on James Mead who was one of the earliest Keynesians, uh, because his, his postgraduate study consisted of a year in, Cam in Cambridge, just at the time that Keynes was moving um, towards the general theory of employment, interest and money. And Mead, and, and for that matter, Robbins were um, uh, very strong supporters um, of the uh, Keynes this clear union plan. Um, and James also actually was, um, and Robbins, was very supportive of the uh, British government's post-war um, white paper on employment policy. Um, but having observed high unemployment in Britain before the, gold, the world slum, as a result of Britain being on the gold standard, Mead always favoured variable exchange rates, not freely floating, um, but managed, and he always preferred this over fixed brains. So, um, he, and he was more concerned with the balance of payments adjustment problem uh, than he was with the problem of international liquidity. And this is a difference, um, or these are differences from uh, Triffin, obviously. Um, I mean, they were concerned with the same problems, but they with different emphasis and different possible solutions. Uh, they both, of course, 
intent, well, I shouldn't say of course, they're both intended to pursue academic careers, but given the state of the world, as young men, they both became public servants and influential ones as well. It's already mentioned, of course, that Triffin joined the Federal Reserve Board in Washington in 42. Meade managed to leave Geneva in 1940 and became a wartime British civil servant. Um, after the war, Triffin went to the IMF, but returned to academic life at Yale in 1951. Meade, similarly, um, stayed on in government service as head of the government's economic section, succeeding Robbins. Um, but he left in September 1947 for the London School of Economics. It is, by the way, possible that Triffin and Meade first met at the GATT negotiations in Geneva in the summer of 1947. Um, but that is just a conjecture. Um, now, having left government service, Meade was obviously not involved, as Triffin was, in the negotiation for European Payments Union. But although he was out of government service, he was actually consulted by the UK Treasury, just at the point when Britain was reluctant to join. And um, I'm glad to report that he argued in favour of the EPU proposals. In 1961, so a year after gold and the dollar crisis, James, I mean, Treffin wrote to James Mead uh, to compliment him on a brilliant paper on the future of international trade and payments, which had just been published. Here, Meade proposed an alternative to the Triffin plan, which he described, Meade described, as a marriage between Triffin and flexible exchange rates. Uh, the, this plan involved the major countries paying all their monetary reserves into the International Monetary Fund, including their gold, and therefore thereafter use gold certificates, which they would receive for their reserves and gold. Um, as, the, as their monetary reserves. They'd let the value of their currencies um, fluctuate in terms of these gold certificates, but managing the floating by means of um, an exchange equalization account. Um, and since the IMF would, under this plan, hold an enormous additional fund of gold and national currencies, it could also, and he thought should, function as a supranational exchange's equalization account at the same time. Triffin told me that he thought that the two proposals were complementary, or rather, I quote, that mine is merely the entrance door to yours. And his own proposals were, Triffin's, were a first step in the right direction. Now he had his doubts about flexible exchange rates, but admitted these really concerned freely floating rates um, and not, not to James's needs internationally managed um, rates. Um, a year later, Mead submitted his paper to the US Joint Committee, Economic Committee, which had a subcommittee on international exchange. And he commented that his own plan was frankly utopian, um, maintain, outlining a perfect or ideal system of international payments. But some practical steps needed to be taken immediately. And there, quote, I have personally a preference for the method advocated by Professor Triffin, unquote. Um, a few years later, Mead published a sequel to this, this 1961 paper where he, he made it abundantly clear that he was more concerned with the adjustment problem than the liquidity problem, argued again for flexible exchange rates, but this time selecting, um, suggesting a sliding parity, um, what of course was more commonly known as a crawling peg. Um, he supported Ed Bernstein in favoring an increase in IMF quotas, um, as well, but he admitted that this plan, which was not hardly a plan really, a small plan, was much more modest than the Triffin plan, 
1967, James Mead attended a conference in Bologna with, at which Triffin, Bernstein, Jacques Rueff, um, and Lana Robbins were um, all the main speakers. Now, this is my one real mention of Robbins, who spoke first. He was supposed to provide a summary of the issues before the whole thing got going. And the one point he stressed was that, a pair of points, he that was that he sympathized with Triffin's aim of bringing the IMF nearer to Keynes' original plan of an international central bank rather than a fund. But he expected it wouldn't happen. And that, as indeed happened, ad hoc arrangements like the creation of SDRs uh, would be tried instead. Now, Mead, as I said, was one of the other participants, and his remarks were reported verbatim in the conference proceedings. He began, I feel very sincerely and very strongly that the attention given to liquidity in our discussions is quite out of proportion to the attention that's been given to adjustment. Unquote. He pointed out that Germany, West Germany and the US were both, had both very successful policies in that West Germany had full employment, rapid growth, moderate inflation and a balance of payment surplus, where the US um, had low unemployment and moderate inflation and a large balance of payments deficit. I should have been extremely loath, he said, to have said to Germany, you really must inflate, you must give up this extremely successful policy. And I wouldn't like to say to the US, you must deflate. Um, on liquidity, he, which he did as what he thought was a minor problem, of course, he agreed with both Rueff and Triffin in wanting an end to the gold exchange standard. But then, he said, I'm afraid that having really said all my betters, if not my elders, have been thinking of the secondary problem when they ought to be thinking of the primary problem, I'd better pipe down. Truffin is recorded as responding that um, not just that he disliked floating exchange rates, but that with respect to managed floating, he actually wondered how the IMF would manage the international inter equalization account. And quote, I won't accuse him of being visionary as that charge has often been directed to me, but I think he would be giving the fund a very difficult assignment. Um, there are further similar encounters between Trippin and Mead, but um, I don't need to go into those here. Um, but since Trippin has is the forgotten architect of the Euro, I should mention Mead's views on that subject. Uh, I won't have much to say on this because he was very consistent. He consistently warned that a common currency should not be introduced in the absence of a com common budget and common fiscal policies. He wasn't against the idea of a common currency, um, but said he, he thought you couldn't have, it was not sustainable um, without common um, fisc you know, fiscal policies as well as monetary policies. In 1972-73, he was a member of a European Commission study, study group in Brussels on economic and monetary union. Um, I, and Triffin may have been here, I'm not sure. Um, James was invited by Triffin's friend, Fred Boyer, um, who told him that Triffin was going to be invited, but anyway, in November 72, me told the group that a com again, that a common currency could not be contemplated without coordination of domestic monetary and fiscal policies in order to maintain employment. And I quote, I can think of no more certain way of ensuring a disastrous collapse of the whole idea of European Union than to devise a system which is bound to be the cause and seen to be the cause of unemployment. In February 30, in 1973, he again argued that if you set up monetary union, um, you may in fact make it harder to bring about economic union. He also argued for variable exchange rates and a community exchange equalization account. Um, he did favour 
the idea of a new European account, unit of account. Um, in fact, he was he argued very strongly in favour of it. Um, but he equally argued that it, this was not the time yet to make the uh, Europa or Europa, as you like to call it, a common currency. And he didn't sign the report. Um, Uh, now, two years later, um, Triff um, Mead was invited to again to the European Commission, this time in, to speak in a series of seminars, um, which I think must be a continuation of those um, initiated by, by Triffin. Um, if I said two years later, I meant 10 years later, so we're, we're now well into the 80s. And you won't be surprised that the talk in November 1983 was on international cooperation in macro policies and advocated a crawling peg for the European currencies managed by a community exchange equalization account. When this was published in London, he called it a new Keynesian Bretton Woods. Because after all, it was 40 years on since Bretton Woods. And since then, experience had demonstrated the problems of the adjustable peg. Um, International capital mobility had increased enormously, and there were the needs of the less developed countries to be taken into account. Now, I could say more about James, what James had to say in the next, the next 10 years, but um, I will be brief. I'm going to end by quoting his earliest remarks on the idea of a common currency for a group of nations. They come in a chapter on an international currency of a book that he wrote in the first three months of the Second World War, when he was, as it were, trapped in Geneva um, and unable to appoint to leave Geneva. Um, but the chapter begins with, quote, in many respects, the institu institution of an international currency would have the same results as the return of the member states to the gold standard, unquote. And he ended, in fact, an international currency system is not appropriate for an international organization of states with divergent international economic policies if those states desire to preserve a large measure of control over their economic affairs. Um, I said I would end on that, but I think I, I, given that what's, what has been said, uh, so far this afternoon, I would like to stress that um, James, like James Mead, like Triffin, was always concerned with international cooperation and would have um, wholeheartedly supported what Jacques de la Rosière has just said. Thank you. Professor Susan Housen, thank you very much indeed for uh, those insights and comparing and contrasting Triffin's thinking with that of other major contemporary figures, notably uh, James Mead. Uh, we really uh, appreciate that. And thank you also for joining us from, from Toronto. I should just take the opportunity to say that uh, for those who are tuned into this uh, EPRS book talk, there's the opportunity to ask questions or make comments uh, about any of the uh, presentations so far. So please feel free to use either the Q&A function or the chat function to do so. And I'll try and take as many of those uh, as possible. Please don't be shy in that regard. Um, last but not least, in terms of our discussants, I'm going to go over to uh, Bernard Soin, who is president of Robert Triffin International, uh, which, uh, as the French say, has pérennisé the uh, memory of Robert Triffin and his contribution to uh, the European monetary integration process. He's also honorary chairman of the European League for Economic Cooperation, which was set up, I think, immediately after the Second World War. He himself has a distinguished public policy career. He was an economic advisor in DG Economics and Finance in the European Commission. He was chef de cabinet to a Belgian finance minister, and as I mentioned before, has been both an executive director of the World Bank and a director of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Over to you. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be with you uh, tonight. In 2010, the association Robert Triffin International launched 
the Trithim 21 initiative uh, to demonstrate the continued relevance today of the intellectual heritage of uh, Trifin, in particular the Trifin uh, dilemma. A lot has already been said about the nature of this uh, dilemma and its um, evolution. On this topic, I can be rather, rather short. Originally, uh, the dilemma was about the unsustainability of this uh, system with the convertibility into gold. Subsequently, it has become more of a fiscal uh, dilemma, uh, still with us today, in fact, in a world uh, characterized by huge uncertainties and the absence of a genuine lender of last resort, uh, there is an insatiable appetite for safe assets, the satisfaction of which depends on the constant increase of liabilities issued by the U.S. Treasury. The question is how long will confidence in the dollar will, will, com, will be compatible with the illimited expansion of U.S. indebtedness, which is estimated today in uh, net terms at 65% of the U.S. GDP or even 17% of the world GDP, according to Andrew Schenk. Um, another um, uh, dimension of this um, uh, unsustainability is, as has been explained, the disappearance uh, of macroeconomic uh, discipline. In fact, uh, huge um, uh, surpluses um, are, are making possible huge uh, deficits. Another insustainability is the inequitable uh, character of the international monetary uh, system, the exorbitant uh, privilege, but let's not forget that it has also as a counterpart uh, the exorbitant uh, uh, burden of being the, the consumer of last resort, or that um, exorbitant privilege of being the banker of the world means that the United States has also to be the, the lender uh, or creditor of last resort, as we have seen in the recent uh, COVID crisis with the Fed having to, to extend a huge swap uh, facilities to, to central banks all around the world. Another aspect um, that is in fact unsustainable is the instrumentalization of the dollar for um, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, purposes. But let me perhaps concentrate on a few um, other aspects that have not been uh, so much touch, touched um, um, in, um, so far. Uh, the first one will be uh, the built-in destabilizer, uh, which is a mechanism that Robert Triffin uh, identified um, at the end of his, of his life, particularly in relation with um, emerging market economies. Um, a, a second uh, aspect is the structural instability of financial markets and the questions we may raise today about the compatibility of the current international monetary and financial system uh, with the huge financing needs uh, for the ecological uh, transition. A third aspect is the new blind spots in uh, financial regulation and supervision that were identified in a by a recent uh, uh, Robert Trevin International Task Force. Um, the last two points will be the, the global liquidity trap in which we find ourselves and the prospects of moving to a multilateral um, uh, reserve currency. First, uh, this built-in destabilizer, which at the end of his life, uh, Trifin presented as a corollary uh, to his um, uh, uh, dilemma. Uh, the enunciation is the following. The use of a national currency as international currency generates a is a destabilizer through the spillover to the rest of the world of the monetary conditions, uh, particularly in the United States. In particular, central banks of emerging market economies are threatened with destabilizing inflows and outflows of short-term capital unless they align themselves on the U.S. monetary policy. Central banks of emerging market economies are also inclined uh, to pile up additional reserves, resisting appreciation of their currency and re-injecting their dollar reserves in the international capital markets 
creating a multiplier effect and driving further down interest rates. Uh, our view is that this excess of liquidity already contributed to the genesis of the great financial crisis of 2008, and that the excess of liquidity is now massively compounded by the quantitative easing policies pursued since um, 2010. These contributed to a massive increase in um, indebtedness. A few points about um, uh, financial markets. Um, uh, already a lot has been said about the moral problem of um, uh, capital flows going in the wrong direction. But an additional um, the problem, which I, I think Trifin was already um, sensitive to, uh, is that financial liberalization and globalization have been based on the unfounded belief in the efficiency of financial markets. Financial markets are inherently unstable as the behavior of financial operators on the supply and demand side for financial assets are not independent, but linked through mimetic competition in the assessment of liquidity condition, which tends to be self-fulfilling, as uh, Minsky demonstrated, and Minsky was also a friend of Trifin. This generates a succession of euphoria and panic as a result of subjective common perceptions of liquidity. And this raises the very serious questions, how under circums these circumstances could we mobilize the huge capital flows needed to finance the long-term investments in that environmental transition with which have a social return exceeding their private return. How to avoid that the savings in the world, including in emerging market economies, would be uh, absorbed by uh, speculation or by this continued buildup of um, uh, reserve assets. A third important point relates to the new blind spots in financial regulation and supervision. Um, in 2019, uh, Robert Trifin International uh, launched a working party on managing global liquidity as a global uh, public good. Uh, the report was uh, written by André Icard and uh, Philippe uh, Turner. And some of its conclusions um, um, are really alarming. Uh, the regulation and supervision of banking activities have been strengthened since the global financial crisis. New vulnerabilities have emerged, particularly due to the increasing and often opaque part of intermediation taking place through non-bank entities which are not regulated and do not have direct access to refinancing by their central bank. The consequent higher liquidity risks are individually covered by an intensive use of collateral assets. But the co-variation of collaterals with the cycle raises a genuine global systemic risk. The higher pro-cyclical behavior of the repo market impairs the effectiveness of the monetary policy tools, as we have seen with the recent collapse of the Archegos hedge fund. This generates a huge structural increase in the demand for safe assets as collaterals. The dollar safe assets constitute the basis of what we may call a reverse pyramid of global liquidity. And um, my colleague in um, Robert Trifid International, Christian Guimers, has written a very seminal uh, article on this subject, showing that the resulting structural shortage of dollar safe assets as collateral constitutes perhaps the newest form of the Trifin dilemma and his built-in destabilizer. Also, the dollar business of non-banks outside the United States is now far higher than before the global financial crisis, raising concern about currency, maturity, and liquidity mismatches, particularly in the absence of a dollar lender of last resort. And last but not least, as a percentage of global GDP, bond credit has now overtaken uh, uh, bank credit.
the deflationary effect of the mercantilist policies of the surplus countries and their refusal to pursue expansionary fiscal policies induces central banks to adopt what has been called non-conventional quantitative easing policies, which leads to an exponential increase of liquidities. However, as a result of large and long-term uncertainties and the higher returns of speculation, these liquidities are not achieving their objective of stimulating long-term investment in the real economy. They are massively invested in short-term instruments driving further down interest rates and driving up stock exchanges and real estate prices, while the world remains direly short of long-term investments, such as those required to fund the environmental transition and to attain the sustainable development goals. The dynamics of the current non-system are unsustainable. This is the conclusion, not of myself, but of Mark Carney, former governor of Bank of, of, of England and of Bank of, of Canada, in his Jackson Hole speech of August 2019. Um, he said the dynamics of the current system are unsustainable and increasing structural risk, in particular what he termed and what many people call the risk of a global liquidity trap. And he concluded that we needed to change the game. And uh, even more, more recently, uh, if you read the, uh, the Financial Times, uh, you perhaps uh, saw uh, last uh, Saturday's article by uh, John Plender. Powell faces difficult path to normalization in his second term, in which he concludes, two questions arise. Is normalization a chimera? And can the dollar's role, the world preeminent reserve currency, survive? against a background of monetary instability and fiscal excess, while the U.S. continues to represent a declining share of global uh, GDP. But, in fact, um, a number of us in uh, Robert Triffin International, it's not um, a, a shared conclusion by everybody, uh, is that solutions to all these problems exist. Of course, they can be found in Robert Triffin's uh, own ideas for a multilateral um, reserve um, uh, uh, assets. Uh, in fact, Triffin's ideas inspired a very comprehensive report uh, that was prepared in 2010 uh, by the Palais Royal Initiative, which brought together a number of very uh, prominent uh, central um, uh, bankers. It, wa it was launched by Alexandre Lamfalusi, my, my predecessor here at Robert Trivin International by Michel Cordesu and by Tommaso Padoaschiopa, but I may remind you that Paul Volcker uh, endorsed the, the conclusion of this um, of, of these report. Unfortunately, um, it was published at a time when the, the, the debt crisis in the Eurozone uh, um, appeared and therefore the report was, uh, was shelved. But the, the working group has um, clearly defined a, a blueprint of the, of the reform, and more recently uh, in an article by Michel Condesu and Anup Singh, a sequenced agenda has been um, uh, uh, proposed. On this side, also Robert Trippin International uh, had uh, convened a few years ago a task force on uh, how to improve the special drawing right. And the special drawing right is again um, uh, in, the, um, in, in the newspapers with the, the recent decision to uh, allocate uh, the equivalent of $650 billion of S SDR. So uh, we could redirect those SDRs. We could reform. Uh, there are a number of legal changes that would be, that would be needed, but perhaps we might have a window of opportunity with a more favorable attitude of the United States towards multilateralism to try to, um, as we said in the, the title of our report, to use the special drawing right as a lever to reform the international um, the monetary um, uh, system. Um, 
In fact, our view is that moving from the present dollar system to a multilateral reserve currency, uh, which would not, which by definition would not be the debt of any particular country, but of the global system, would solve the Trifin dilemma, remove the adverse built-in destabilizer, and make possible a collegial management of global liquidity as a global public good. Uh, and the basis for such a systemic solution already exists. It is the special drawing right created by the IMF uh, at the instigation of Robert Triffin in the 1960s with the stated objective, which is part of the IMF Articles of Agreement, Article 22, uh, of becoming the principal reserve assets in the international uh, monetary system. Of course, the SDR would need to be transformed into a genuine multilateral drawing right at some point, like the EQ becoming the euro, it should stop being a basket of national currencies and become a genuine multilateral currency. The IMF should simultaneously become a multilateral central bank organizing the clearing of international payments above national central banks and a genuine lender of last resort, issuing the safest assets of all safe assets and influencing global liquidity through purchases or withdrawal of eligible national bonds. This should allow each central bank to pursue the monetary policy best suited to its particular situation without concern for spillovers or spillbacks. And the increase of safe assets denominated in multilateral drawing rights should facilitate a corresponding decrease in quantitative um, uh, earnings in, uh, in QE by the major um, national uh, central banks. In this way, global liquidity management should also facilitate a managed decrease of the financial sphere and a reorientation of incentives towards the financing of the sustainable development goals and of the environmental transition. This may appear to you uh, some sort of a, an utopia, but I think that it is our role as a successors of, of Trifin uh, to, to keep alive, alive this uh, blueprint and to try to always improve uh, on uh, possible roadmaps uh, leading to this more equitable and more sustainable uh, system. I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bill and Swan, for um, that intervention. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in which bear upon some of the economic arguments that have been ventilated already, and I'd like to just flag those up. We don't have a huge amount of time, so I'd invite each of the um, speakers, uh, both I'm going to invite both the co-authors and the discussants to comment briefly, uh, obviously to keep their remarks fairly uh, compact. And the, the, the one question uh, is from Francisco Papadia and the other is from Joanna Apap. And they both really bear on the same question, which is this a debate, if you like, which um, existed right the way through until the foundation of, of monetary union between, I think, what Ivo and Lara call the voluntarists or what used to be known as the monetarists on the one hand, notably uh, policymakers in, in France, and the economists on the other, notably policymakers in Germany, about the... Um, degree of, on the one hand, economic convergence that was necessary in advance for the successful operation of a single currency, and secondly, the degree to which it was then uh, would be par in parallel required to have some kind of more active macroeconomic policy at European Union level. And of course, by implication, whether um, the speakers feel that the recent move to create the NGEU, the European Economic Recovery fund effectively offers a first significant step in that direction. So I'm going to ask, first of all, Ivan and Lara if they would like to comment on that, and then each of the uh, three discussants in turn. Over to you. Yeah, that's um, a beautiful question. Uh, and let, let's say um, it's quite clear that with the, the next generation uh, EU plan, um, th this is Let's say I'm very much agreed with Shaq uh, that uh, Triffin, he was a monetarist. He was looking what can happen on the monetary side, and he was not looking at economic adjustment. Um, so um, there 
the new um, uh, next generation EU, but it brings a, a macroeconomic uh, pillar at the EU level. Now, uh, will it be uh, sufficient to, to get to um, a European economic governance? Uh, in, in, let's say in the Werner report, there was the idea to have uh, an economic and monetary union, you should have two centers of decision making, European system of central banks and a center of decision making for economic policy. Now, uh, will this next generation EU evolve to um, such a center of decision making? Well, in first instance, I think the crucial question, there are also legal issues, it's uh, uh, it's quite clear that it is based on the article for exceptional circumstances, so it's uh, not, so it can be a precedent, but it, uh, one has to find another legal requirement. But from an economic point of view, uh, let's say, will the next generation EU be successful? Will it really bring structural reform and economic growth in the countries which will receive the funds. I, I think that will be a very important factor which will determine the success. Uh, if it's successful, one can have other, other steps. If it's not successful, well, uh, there will be much more skepticism. Thank you, uh, Ilari. Well, I agree with uh, with, uh, um, with Ivo, so maybe it's better to listen other. Uh, yes, I have some difficulty with the uh, ideas proposed by Bernard Snoy. Um, it is not by inflating the SDR allocations that you will resolve the problems of our world. The problems of our world are uh, very much uh, linked to the ecological investments that have to take place, lest we would be completely disappearing for some of us from the planet. So it is not by allocating more liquidity at the level of the IMF that you are going to resolve these problems. These problems can only be resolved by the mobilization of savings uh, into these necessary investments, long-term investments. And you will only do that if you can offer to the savers, uh, uh, I would say, a normal remuneration. But if you tell them those savers. If you tell them the only thing that you will get if you put long-term money in risky business, uh, which are these ecological investments, the only remuneration you will get is negative, that is, you will be taxed, uh, you won't get that money. And the money will go, as John Maynard Keynes had perfectly foreseen will go to short-term uh, instruments, uh, which is the overwhelming tendency uh, over the last years. And therefore, you won't have the channel investment uh, coming from long-term savings. You won't have it. And of course, what I'm just saying is uh, is a reflection on monetary policy, which has been focusing on negative interest rates over the years and not understanding that a normal decent remuneration uh, engineered by the market, by the equilibrium between savings and investment, would be necessary. And uh, we have gotten now uh, trapped in this uh, liquidity, super liquidity situation. And that is why I'm not sure that printing more SDRs is going to solve the problems. I think if you have a structural problem, you have to deal with it in a structural way. 
And the only way you can really promote long-term investment that would be good for the planet is by channeling long-term savings, which exist, which are actually very abundant these days, to channel them into uh, worthy uh, projects and, uh, and concerns. And uh, that seems to me more important than uh, creating uh, another uh, allocation of SDRs. I'm sorry to say that, but I'm, I'm a bit skeptical on that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Susan, would you like to add uh, your perspective? Um, stick to what Need might have said, because the, I mean, the interesting thing um, about the question um, that was put about the degree of economic convergence needed for a common currency was, of course, one that um, James Mead was always addressing when he was thinking about common currencies. I mean, you know, from 1939 onwards, I mean, his point was consistently that the degree of economic convergence needed was very high and much higher than, people, than the opponents of the European Monetary Union um, uh, admitted. And he argued, I mean, in the, in, when he was on that study group um, in Brussels in the 70s, I mean, he was, what I didn't say was that he was, he was very explicit, he had other papers that he wrote for them, where he was explicitly arguing that econ full economic union, you know, must come before you attempt monetary union. In other words, you need European economic economic integration before um, um, going trying to go to um, adopt a common currency. Um, and um, you know, given what we've been seeing in the last decade, I think that Mead was probably right. And uh, finally, uh, Bernard Troy, any uh, reflections on the questions and or what, what other speakers have said? Yes, thank you very much to Jacques de la Rosière for, for his remarks. And indeed, we, we need very frequently uh, this remark. Of course, my point was not that the uh, special drawing right was a magic instrument that would solve all the, all the problems. In fact, it's, it's a solution only as a part of a fundamental systemic change, a change in the, in the nature of the role of the International Monetary Fund, becoming a lender, a genuine lender of last resort and being also endowed with more authority for, for what Jacques de la Rosière recommended, which is extremely important, which is the, the uh, cooperation or coordination uh, of macroeconomic policies. But I think that the key point is how do we get out of the present liquidity trap? Because what we are seeing uh, is worrying. I mean, we never have had more liquidity than we have today. Uh, we have indeed a huge uh, savings, but they are not moving in the right direction. Uh, they, they continue to, me, to move, as Robert Trippin denounced it, I mean, from south to north. Um, the emerging market economies uh, cannot dedicate uh, their, um, their savings to the objectives of the sustainable development goals or to the ecological uh, uh, transition because a large part of their savings is going back to the United States, is, uh, is absorbed uh, in the, the short-term money markets and in this insatiable um, appetite for US safe uh, assets. And as I said, we discovered, and I'm not a specialist of that, uh, that U.S. safe assets are more and more needed as collateral uh, in the repo market because there is a structural change in the international <coughs> financial markets moving from bank activities to, um, uh, to non-banks. Um, and and we, we, we don't see, I mean, how we are going to get out. Um, we see all around the world, I mean, this nervousness uh, about um, how, to, how to move out of quantitative um, uh, easing. 
uh, again uh, today uh, in the Financial Times, um, there was an article by Robin Wigglesworth, trading conditions reveal more fragility than investors think. So we have a, a systemic uh, um, uh, fragility. <coughs> the, the SDR is, is only a, a currently a marginal question. Uh, what I was meaning is that the, the allocation of SDR provides perhaps a, a window of opportunity to think about the SDR, which has been completely uh, marginalized. Um, and of course, we are playing here also uh, geopolitics. Uh, uh, questions is, is, is uh, uh, will the United States perhaps find it expedient um, to, to do more with the SDR without the consent of the United States. And there are a few people in academia, uh, um, who, when, for instance, Stiglitz, you may like him or not, um, who, who begin to think about that. And of course, the other uh, unknown is, is uh, China. Uh, and I also very much agree with what Jacques de la Rosière said about the danger of currency wars, uh, the danger of protectionism, the danger uh, that globalization would be, would be split in um, hostile um, uh, uh, groups. So the question is, before the, the Chinese try to transform the renminbi into another dollar with uh, exorbitant privilege and all that, uh, would it not be wiser to sit down together and uh, try to build a multilateral um, a system. It's kind of a new Bretton Woods, of course, extremely um, uh, ambitious, but perhaps in extreme danger. And we are in the danger of, of a new major financial crisis. Can we not prevent a, a crisis, sit down and, and try to, to think about an, a, a, another system and the role of Robert Trevin International? I mean, we are only a very small group of, of, of people is to, to stimulate. Uh, like Robert Trippin, we, we, we have to be a little bit impertinent and, uh, and um, move up um, uh, ideas, uh, even if it, most of the, the great majority, of course, of people believe that all those things are utopia or that it is premature to think about it. But, uh, okay, we, we, we believe that we are the followers of Trippin and it is our our duty, Trifin never abandoned um, uh, his, uh, his proposal to make the SDR the, the key of, of the system. He was, of course, a follower of, uh, of Keynes. On the other hand, uh, Trifin was always very pragmatic. And uh, when things could not move at the global level, he would try to do things at the regional level or try again uh, with a different uh, set of arguments. Thank you. Thank you for that. And that brings us, uh, I think, quite naturally to the conclusion of today's event. Uh, it's been a, a real joy. I, mean, I think uh, somebody once joked that economics was the dismal science. I would say it's full of very interesting issues which keep running over many decades and are the refracted through, in effect, the circumstances of every moment. And from what was being said between the wars to what's in today's Financial Times, we've uh, seen how uh, lively those and uh, continuous those issues are. So congratulations, if I may say so, to um, Ivo and Hilaria for uh, producing this book and stimulating that discussion today. And thanks very much to Jacques, to Susan and Bernard for commenting so effectively on it. Our next APRS book talk is in fact only two days away. And usually we're having two in one week. And that's with Luke van Middelaar, who'll be talking about his new book, Pandemonium. Saving Europe, coming on uh, hot on the heels of uh, alarms and excursions. He's looking at the way in which the European Union political system has been impacted by the recent coronavirus crisis. And he'll be in conversation with uh, Katerina Krasinovsky from the European University Institute in Florence, also at Central European University, and Professor Vernon Bolton of King's uh, College London and Oxford. But on behalf of all of those who've joined us this afternoon, I'd just like to say a very, very big thank you to all our speakers uh, this afternoon and early evening and to wish you all a very enjoyable evening now. Thanks so much for joining us and thank you to uh, everybody who's been online. Goodbye.